the natural extension of Marathon, which would have turned out to be something along the lines of Quake. Jason Jones, the co-founder of Bungie, used these words to describe one of the ideas the team began to develop after the release of Durandal in 1995. Instead of making more Marathon games, they were willing to try something new. After releasing a couple more games, Myth and Myth 2, a group of people at Bungie started working on a new RTS game titled Armor, which after being deemed boring, had its name changed to Monkey Nuts, and eventually to Blam since Jones couldn't tell his mother the name. Just imagine how worried your mom would be if you suddenly told her, oh don't worry mom, the team and I are working on Monkey Nuts. Not only would you be disowned, but you'd also be labeled as the guy who created Gorilla Balls. During development, the team realized how funny it would be for players to drive vehicles themselves instead of having their computers do it. Quote, and controlling in their vehicle, just that double tactile nature of load a dude in, get dude out, hands on the steering wheel, it was like this shouldn't be an RTS game. End quote. These apparently were Alex Seropian's words, one of the initial founders of Bungie and later president. With this, by mid-1998, the game became a third-person shooter. Peter Tamty, Bungie's executive vice president at the time, had contacts at Apple and managed to get lead writer Joseph Staten and project lead Jason Jones an audience with freaking Steve Jobs. They impressed Jobs and he agreed to debut Bungie's new game at the 1999 Mac World Conference and Expo. The anticipation for this new unknown game began to build up after positive reviews from Jobs. Journalists. Although the game was referred to as Blam, in reality it was still an unnamed project. Bungie hired a branding firm who came up with the name Covenant, and Paul Russo, an artist at Bungie, suggested the name Halo, which was supported by designer Marcus Letho. Then, on July 21st, 1999, Steve Jobs announced that Halo would be released for Mac OS and Windows simultaneously. Bungie promised an open world game with a destructible environment, persistent details like shell casings, and variable weather. The early versions also featured Fauna and the Master Chief was simply called the Cyborg. None of these made it to the final product. As with many games, Bungie faced the difficulties of game development and found themselves in financial trouble. Not only that, but their last game published at the time, Myth 2, had a glitch that caused the contents of the directory in which it was installed on to be wiped. A glitch discovered after 200,000 copies had already been produced. Bungie recalled the copies and fixed the problem, which cost them $800,000. To try and fix their financial issues, Bungie sold a share of the company and publishing rights to Take-Two Interactive, and later sought acquisition by Microsoft. Microsoft, already working on the first Xbox, reached an agreement with Take-Two Interactive and acquired both Bungie and Halo, while letting Take-Two keep Myth and Oni. June 19, 2000. Halo is now the future flagship game for Xbox. Jason Jones pushed the change from third-person to first-person shooter, a rare thing at the time. To accomplish the overcoming of the challenges they were facing, all other Bungie projects were cancelled and the entirety of the company his efforts was now centered in Halo. B30 was the first piece of the game that proved this was not just a fever dream. It was possible, and it motivated the team. B30 would later become the silent cartographer. Release dates are the doom of art. No matter what shape or form they take, deadlines are always a concern you have to deal with, and Bungie had to make cuts to features and scope for Halo. No open world, a shorter campaign, a level substituted with a cutscene, story fixes, reusing levels, rewriting the script, no more online features and a bunch of people filled with anxiety. Some of the staff even slept in the office for a few months before release to ensure it did. That right there was love. The game had a lot of changes in the art department, hiring Shi Kai Wang to refine the designs already in place. Suffice to say, they put an incredible amount of work, love, passion, and dedication into the artistic side of Halo Combat Evolved. The legendary Marty O'Donnell alongside legendary Michael Salvatore were tasked with creating the music for Halo. O'Donnell wanted to create music that would incorporate itself into the game world. He and the level designer would play through the missions together to make sure it worked. He wanted the music to be special and not just background. He also had to score the cutscenes in only three days. At E3 2001, an exhibition of the game had mixed critics after a display of a broken game with frame rate issues as well as technical problems. Hell, even Microsoft was starting to lose faith in Halo. Bungie also refused to change the name of the game. However, they added the Combat Evolved part of it to make it sound more descriptive. Halo the Fall of Reach was a prequel novel which released a few weeks before the game. It was almost cancelled and it became a publisher's weekly bestseller with almost 200,000 copies sold. And on November 15th, 2001, the game released alongside the original Xbox. 50% of Xbox consoles were sold alongside the game. 1 million units now belong to people after only 5 months and by July of 2003, the game had sold 3 million copies and 4 million by January of 2004. Halo was praised by critics 
and loved by players. It received multiple awards and of course it also got some negative criticism based on the repetitiveness of some levels. One specific review hit the nail though. Stick Current's review for Edge praised the game as the most important launch game for every console ever. Looking back, we can see how big of an impact Halo Combat Evolved had in the gaming industry, modernizing the entire FPS genre, innovating in many aspects, and single-handedly giving Xbox massive success becoming its flagship franchise. They say that sequels are the doom of art, and through even more challenges in development, the struggle Bungie went through paid off big, big time. Halo 2 was not a doomed sequel. On its first day release, it made 125 million US dollars with 2.38 million copies sold earning the title of the fastest selling US media product in history. And holy mother of god, Halo 3. Brother, Halo 3 beat Halo 2. Halo 3 had the biggest opening day in entertainment history, with 170 million US dollars made within 24 hours of release. Bungie was an okay company. It made games that some people enjoyed and things were going well for them. But I assure you that nobody, inside or outside of Bungie, ever expected them to become the creators of one of the biggest, most important, most loved game franchises in history. Halo took both Xbox and Bungie into the Stratosphere, Halo, a legendary game made Bungie. Nah, that's wrong. Bungie, through love, passion, dedication, hope, and respect, made Halo. They are proof of what pure love for your art can accomplish when combined with sheer will. I'm throwing up while writing this, and I'm probably gonna be crying when voicing it too. Which, just a little bit. If you grew up anywhere from 2000 to 2010, you had some amazing moments with these games, and I'm sure your memories of them are some of the best you've got. Whether you like Halo or not right now, you cannot deny how great they were back then. The last Halo game Bungie made was Halo Reach, and everything I just said praising previous Halo games also applies here. Personally, Halo Reach was the first Halo game in which I poured thousands of hours into. The story was so good, I'm sure I played through it at least a hundred times. The multiplayer was my first ever taste of how much fun playing games online could be, of how you can meet people online and have fun with them simply because you both do the same silly strats in the game, of how much I could just love playing a game that was truly good. The music, environment, story, characters, writing, voice acting, the visual designs, mechanics, the multiplayer, maps, vehicles, enemies, weapons, game modes, the best customization in all of Halo games, the best progression system, no paid BS, just things that you could obtain through the game. That's rich. I haven't talked about another really important part of Halo's success. Can you guess what it is? Luck. Nah, I'm kidding. I'm talking about the community. I can't really go back in time and explore how big the community was at certain times or the growth it had as the years passed. So let's think. Halo CE wasn't exactly big when it comes to online stuff, so it must have been Halo 2 when things started to grow. However, Red vs Blue, a huge presence in the Halo community, started making content since the first Halo, so there was a community, just not as big as in later years. I believe online multiplayer back then played a major role in the development of a community. Thus, I believe Halo 2 opened the doors for lots of people to join and form communities, whether they belong to a big one or their own small self-made community. Halo 3 is when I started to play online games, before that my dad just wouldn't let me, and I also didn't know how to use the internet, so… ah man, does time fly by when you grow up. For my friends at the time, and I assume for some other people, Halo 3 is when they started going to a friend's house to play Halo for hours on end just to go back home and keep going. Up until this point, for my child self back then, communities online weren't even something I thought existed. The more grown up kids might have, and the adults who loved the game probably were part of them. These communities didn't just require a game for them to exist. Xbox Live services were nowhere as good as they are today back then. The internet itself wasn't as accessible, not only due to the structure of it, but also to how expensive it was to own a computer, or lots of people straight up seeing them as a waste of money. Remember, Halo is many's childhood, which also means that most of them had zero access to the internet, so for them Halo was a game that other kids at school liked, and not something that had communities all over the globe. So the first three games, at least in my experience, were amazingly fun games I could replay a hundred times and have as much fun as the first. Halo Reach is the one that opened the gates not only to communities, but to content creation as a whole. I remember people talking about a secret ending if you pressed some weird hidden 
terminal during the final level, which I couldn't find and never could have because it was a lie. <laughs> I mean, there were even videos showing it, and it disappointed me to know that it was fake. Overall, Halo Reach had probably the biggest Halo community ever. There were hundreds of maps made by them, game mods made by people, videos on the internet, discussions, groups organizing games and stuff. Hell, I even remember how you could even play with the devs of, or something similar at some points and how I never managed to queue up with them. Even something as simple as knowing that the game mode I was playing and the maps were something that someone like me, someone who just enjoyed the game, made. It made my perspective change. A single game made me see the world differently and I'm grateful for it. The fun Halo Reach offered was unparalleled at the time, at least for me, and it was a great way for Bungie to end their legendary franchise. Regardless of what Halo became after Bungie left, they managed to make something so far, and yet so close to perfection. Halo will forever have a special place in my heart. Even if today I have abandoned it, my love for Halo will never disappear. Bungie, you were truly amazing. And if you ever paid attention to some places in Halo 3 ODST, there was something on the back of your mind. In my own young words, or what I remember of them, Destiny, oh, a new game? Halo Destiny? Maybe the future of the Halo world? Oh god, I wonder if I'll ever get to see it. And oh boy, did you get to see it. September 9th. 2014, two months before the 10 year anniversary for Halo 2, Destiny was released to the world. The hype behind Destiny was huge, it was legendary Bungie's new game, the new Halo, the new big thing, Bungie was playing and they were all in for this one. Remember how they revolutionized the FPS genre with Halo? After they did, multiple other studios tried to copy them, making some Halo killers, and if you've been around the internet for a while, you know how this next part goes. Let's go in order, shall we? The launch for Destiny 1 wasn't great. The game had a horrible story. Basically, it had none. The multiplayer was clunky, the people who waited for the game were disappointed, and the opinions surrounding the game were mostly negative. Bungie failed. Eventually, the game released something unique, something that changed the genre one more time. After failing, Bungie released Destiny's first ever raid, The Vault of Glass. No one expected this to happen. Raids were something that belonged in MMOs, WoW for example, and so seeing this inside of a first person shooter game was unusual to say the least. People got into it and they loved it. The Vault of Glass raid saved Destiny single handedly. It attracted people's attention, which is exactly what Bungie needed. The Dark Below was another big fail at story writing, and another nice raid for people to enjoy. The House of Wolves tried to add a survival type game mode, which at the time disappointed a lot of people who were expecting in a third raid, but it also gave birth to the Trials of Osiris. The PvP players had finally gotten something truly new. Monji, I have no idea how you do it, but man are you good when you try. Trials of Osiris had you play PvP matches, where your level was important, which meant that you had to play PvE to level up and improve your equipment before being able to get into PvP. Once you got in, you had to win, not play, win 9 matches in a row. Destiny 1 offered boons which could make this easier. If I remember correctly, you had one extra win, one free win, and one forgiven loss. So, 7 wins in a row with only one possible loss. It was hard. It became the competitive side of the PvP part of the game, and it was also a way to incorporate both PvP and PvE together somehow. The House of Wolves expansion gave the game one of its most iconic game modes, and also one of the most infamous in the shape of the Prison of Elders, a bar attempt at a survival game mode. And now, we get the first showcase of Bungie's flame which forged a gem such as Halo. The Taken King was Destiny's third expansion. It brought an amazing story with actual writing, with actual lore, with actual characters. It was good. A new world space fleshed out like crazy, with secrets that had players hunting for them, events that actually rewarded and challenged people, little collectibles which you had to obtain to craft a weapon, and even the gates to the raid itself within the open world. New subclasses and supers which were obtained during a quest which was honestly really cool, class specific weapons, weapon foundry gear, 17 new exotic weapons, 20 new exotic armors, and a whole bunch of new cosmetics, 
plus some of my favorite emotes to this day. It also added the Black Spindle, an exotic weapon which was obtained in the first ever secret quest. The discovery of this quest was crazy. I remember go <laughs> I remember I got home from school and and my, my dad told me like, hey, yo, I saw this little thing about this Destiny new quest that got released and on Twitter or something or Facebook or something. And I was so excited. <laughs> the moment I got home, I went straight for it. I tried for hours until I managed to somehow get it done. Secret missions like this are some of the best examples of Bungie's capabilities. The Tekken King saved Destiny again. It brought back all players and also new ones, but the one thing that made people stay was what many consider one of the best raids to this day, King's Fall. With the story setting Oryx as a villain who survived our final fight, it was only natural for him to be the last enemy in said raid. People knew a raid was coming, they knew who the last boss would be, and yet no one was ready for such a good experience. It is no exaggeration for me to say that if King's Fall had never existed, I wouldn't be here making this video right now. In fact, I'd probably have a decent life and a bright future instead ah. <laughs> please subscribe please really you'd be helping me like you have no idea honestly King's Fall was the biggest, largest raid we had seen at the time. The size of the Dreadnought, the design of it, the atmosphere, everything was amazing. The opening was simple but good for what it had to do. The jumping puzzle was a lot of fun even if some people have no patience at all. The second encounter was simple and easy. The first boss, the War Priest, was my favorite. I remember this one time I got kicked from the party because I had like a 5 megabyte internet and I had to somehow figure out the calls based on what the others were doing and somehow actually managed to do it. Then you get to Golgoroth, then another jumping puzzle where you had to push someone or tell them to stand in front of the pushy thingies if it was their first time, then the daughters of Oryx, and finally Oryx himself. Man, this raid was so fun, so much so that it made me learn English. This is why I wouldn't be here right now. Long story short, I knew the most basic English and we had Two people who spoke English, three who didn't, and one who spoke both languages. Then the middle guy left and no one could communicate with the other two English speakers because we were all like 14 or 15 years old and sucked at it. And so, your boy summons up the courage of the nine circles of hell. I grab my balls, I turn to these two people, both IRL and in-game, and I do the best of my worst. I speak with the most basic broken English I have ever spoken and somehow manage to get it through. I explain to them the strat, the roles, everyone else's roles, and the real-time comps. Holy, I was sweating blood and crying peace from having to speak English to an actual English speaker. And we did it. We beat the raid my first time doing it. With people I had met that very same day, with some leaving, some joining, and even having to sum up the courage to speak a different language on the spot. One of my best gaming experiences ever. Rise of Iron had a good story again, new quote unquote new enemies and a lot of content. Honestly, after Rise of Iron, Destiny had so much in the way of customization that I believed it would never get any better. Wrath of the Machine was the last raid released for Destiny 1, and it is also considered one of the best to this day. To make this short, Rise of Iron had the quality of the Taken King without the same impact. As good as Rise of Iron was, Taken King allowed Destiny to have a future. The content wasn't there and people's interest was dying down. Without the Taken King, the game would have died right then and there. And for a while after this, the game remained without any more big content drops. I also want to briefly mention the Sparrow Racing League, which is probably the most original event we've had in the game. It happened two times, I believe, and it has never shown up again. And with how bad Destiny 2 is made, Bungie already has too much to deal with for them to spend resources on something like this. Still fond memories though. Then we move on to Destiny 2. The switch from D1 to D2 was a mess. People lost the stuff they had bought with real money and also the stuff they had gotten by putting time into the game. Not only that, but Destiny 2 also meant that it was the same with less. D1 had 4 expansions, D2 had absolutely nothing. Once more, the game had a horribly written story and the multiplayer was somehow worse than D1 at launch. D2 was created to allow Bungie to work with a more modern game. They sacrificed all they had built up in order to be able to build more in the future. The first two expansions, Curse of Osiris and Warmind were as bad as gaming can get. 
Forsaken was like the Taken King. Its quality was abysmally bigger than those before it, its impact was huge, and it gave the game a chance to keep moving. The story, content, and gameplay were amazing in this expansion. It brought the biggest, best, most important raid in Destiny history. Last Wish took 18 hours, 49 minutes, and 11 seconds to be completed on day 1 by Clan Redeem, and it also has the lowest number of day 1 completions with only 12 players finishing it. That is two teams only, and also Daro's team failing day one by two minutes. <laughs> I encourage you to watch Evan F's 1997 video, the wildest 24 hours in the history of Destiny, to get the full experience of how big and crazy this was. At this point, Bungie moved to a one expansion per year mentality. Forsaken released on 2018, then Shadowkeep in 2019. I don't remember too much about the actual game during this period of other than the base game now being free to play and Bungie separating from Activision. The separation had lots of people now hoping for an increase in quality and we were all disappointed? 2020 gave us Beyond Light, a year better than Shadowkeep in my opinion and my most hated subclass. Stasis, which was busted in PvP. Instead of an expansion at the end of the year, 2021 got the anniversary pack, which was a nice extra bit of content we got. Then on February 2022, we got what I believe is the second best expansion we've gotten so far, the Witch Queen. An amazing raid, a new weapon type, the new 2.0 subclasses, and so much more. I am 33 minutes into recording my voice, and at this point in editing, my PC is going to explode, so I'll just say this. The Witch Queen is the most fun I have ever had in Destiny as a solo player, and also the last expansion I have played. I can't say much about Lightfall since I haven't played it at all, but I did see lots of people dislike it and also many who liked it, so let's just say that it was maybe decent. There's also been many seasons, changes to the game, dungeons, secret missions, raids brought back from D1 and even events even though they just reuse the same stuff every year. There's also PvP which is amazing and unbalanced as well as filled with hackers and with no incentives to play. Suffice to say that Bungie has almost abandoned PvP for a long time, recently we got a new rank system, but that's the only real addition to it, and only next year are we getting new maps after years of playing on the same places over and over again. Lots of people in the Destiny community say that PvP should be deleted from the game because it is not a PvP game, and they are wrong. Destiny has had PvP since it released, and there's always been a decently sized section of the player base who only play that. And let's also not forget that the only real content for the PvE side of the game is Grandmaster Nightfalls and Raids. Everything else is way too easy to even be called content, when compared to the PvP content, that is. Overall, I believe Destiny is an extremely easy game that requires no skill even inside the hardest content. Raids are easy as long as you stop actively making mistakes and actually listening to advice on what to do, and Nightfalls work the same way. Just play with your team and that's it. The only place where you need an actual build and knowledge of the game in order for you to beat it is Day 1 Raids. Other than Day 1s, the only hard content is PvP, and that one is hard due to sweaty play players and hackers, not because the game itself is challenging. That being said, I want to point out Bungie's mistake of making the game too easy, giving veteran players no real challenging content where they can prove themselves, which is also why there's player made challenges such as solos or low man raids, but difficulty is something only some people enjoy, and the majority of players just wanna play to forget about their lives while shooting some stuff in a game. In today's news, we have received official confirmation that the final shape has been delayed until June 4th. We also also can't have this video without mentioning the layoffs Bungie had like a month ago, which had people angry at them and some saying they'll cancel their pre-orders of the new expansion. My thoughts on the layoffs are that they suck. There has been some talk about how people tried to ask higher ops for changes in the game, which were ignored, and also the promise Bungie made about not firing anyone. Well, surprise to you if you were a Bungie employee, because now that promise is nothing more than you having no job anymore. There's also how they fired these people at a date in which they wouldn't have to pay them to much and a lot of stuff going on. I honestly have no idea why big companies are being led by the most mediocre people. These layoffs could have been avoided if the people making big decisions understood what's best for the game and how to handle certain things. But anyways, that's a complex problem and there's probably a lot of info we don't know so I can't really give a fully fleshed out opinion on it solely based on what we do know. It sucks and it for sure could have been avoided, but it didn't and now the only thing Bungie can do is fix their product. I also wish 
would love to see Destiny win the best community support at the Game Awards just to see Bungie clown themselves trying to say something remotely positive about this mess of a game. Halo was a great game all around. Halo CE had a massive influence in the future of FPS gaming. Halo 2 and 3 broke records and managed to live up and surpass people's expectations. Halo Reach was a golden brooch ending for the legacy of the now zombie-like Bungie. Truly a legendary franchise while under the care of a legendary developer. A good story, good gameplay, visuals, designs, music, multiplayer, a massive community filled with lots of positivity and lots of memories and fun. Halo is for lots of people a key part of their lives. On the other hand, we've got Destiny, a franchise that quite honestly could have been as good or even better than Halo. However, Bungie felt miserably at it. Only the later part of Destiny 1 was truly good and as for Destiny 2, the quality seems to be all over the place, with some expansions and seasons being incredible, some being mediocre and some being somewhere in the middle. Also, Destiny is a very expensive game and I would never recommend it to anyone. And the community is honestly pretty toxic in a lot of places. We know Bungie is working on Marathon and some Destiny players suspect that the current state of the game is a result of Bungie focusing on their next project. I will say I disagree with people who want to see Marathon fail, but I honestly can't see it being successful. Destiny is big because it's been around for 9 years, then by the time Final Shape is well beyond over and Marathon is not only going to be completely new, but there's also going to be people who will resent it. Destiny is probably going to be mostly gone by 2025, so if you are still playing the game or wish to get back into it, enjoy Destiny's final breath. Whether you play on Xbox, PlayStation or PC, I think we can all agree that Bungie is one of the greatest developers of all time. As bad as Destiny is and has been, there's also been lots of Destiny killers and other games that try to replicate the experience Destiny offers, such as The Division, which is nowhere near as smooth and fun as Destiny, Warframe, which is one of the best, most boring games I have ever played, and even Anthem, which is as dead as a game can be. I said before Bungie is like a zombie. This is because even though the Bungie that made something as good as Halo is gone, you can still see a little bit of it in there. Do you know why there have been so many Destiny killers? Because Destiny is the same as Halo in two ways. One is the gameplay. The gunplay in Destiny is unmatched. It's so good I always want to go back to it and just play some PvP to feel like a badass with how good shooting stuff feels. The other is that just like Halo, Destiny has something other games don't. I talked about some of my experiences in the game, like how it forced me to learn English, and I also left lots of things out because there are just too many. Destiny has given people lots of memories just how Halo did, and it is also a big part of many people's lives. If you have ever played the game with friends or people who you'd later call friends, you know what I'm talking about. You either die a hero or live enough to see yourself become the villain. So far, Bungie has been going downhill and people no longer respect them like they used to. Remember the opening quote for this video? The natural extension of Marathon, which would have turned out to be something along the lines of Quake. Halo, Destiny, and now back to Marathon. I think no one was expecting things to go like this, but in the end, you always go back to the starting line. The question here is whether Bungie will rise once again or fall even lower. Please subscribe and like the video to see the outcome with me and follow my Twitch to watch it in real time. Not only Bungie, but other games and myself. I hope you enjoyed and have a nice day. And to Bungie, good luck, Guardian. Never mind. Okay, Bungie, what is this? How can you sell this starter pack for 15 US dollars? Keep in mind, this is more money than Witch Queen and Beyond Light together, in my country at least. Right now, December 1st, it has been taken down and is no longer available on Steam. Bungie, taking down this starter pack isn't going to magically make it disappear from people's minds, okay? It's always gonna be there. And people People won't hate you because you are selling it, but because you not only consider doing it, you actually did it. And some people even bought it. You are actively trying to be hated by your audience and let me tell you, you are amazing at it. With this now being in Bungie's record, I do hope that Marathon falls flat on its face and keeps Bungie a massive net loss. Bungie, you don't deserve people. You don't deserve anyone working for you. You do not deserve money <laughs> and you deserve to fail. The worst part is that even if Bungie Bungie went bankrupt, the people on top wouldn't even feel it. They just move on to the next victim of their sheer ineptitude and stupidity just to later repeat the same process over and over again. Bungie, you suck, and the people making the big decisions, they suck even more. I was done writing the script, hopeful that the fallen hero could rise back to its throne. But you gave me the perfect ending now. Bungie, a one-of-a-kind developer, with Destiny, a massive wasted potential, and Halo, a massive success like few others. You didn't just fall from grace. 
No, you are now yet another perfect example of a hero who lived for far too long just to see themselves become a villain. Bungie is long gone and their corpse keeps on moving, not even like a zombie, but like a mindless puppet whose strings are controlled by idiots who can't even use their own grid properly. Bungie, Marathon puts you in the map and I hope it also takes you off it. Thanks for watching. The House of Wolves tried to add a survival- okay, I need to drink some water, Jesus Christ.